Hey everybody, Craig from the University of Applied Research and Development, and it is our privilege to have with us Georgie Vesti, who's the producer of Dead Honest, which is a multi-award winning podcast interviewing professionals who work with the dead and the dying. Good morning, Georgie. How are you doing? Very well, thanks, Craig. Good morning. Or evening, really, as it is. Really <laughs> interesting podcast. I mean, I normally get up at four o'clock in the morning to interview people, and I was mm. up at four o'clock in the morning, and I was thinking about doing this interview, so really interesting how did you come up with the idea what motivated you for the dead honest podcast um it actually really has its its origins uh, about 15 years ago i was working in a coroner's office in sydney uh, alongside an incredibly interesting uh, counselor and he was talking to me about the i heard him talking on the phone one day to a woman and i heard him laughing and, and having a great conversation which wasn't unusual funny enough being in a coroner's office but and i asked him about him i said well, who was that and he said it was a woman who he met whose daughter had very tragically been murdered and it was someone he had developed a very close relationship with and he talked about that relationship and it felt uh, quite extraordinary that he should have done such a thing. And I thought, gosh, there's a real opportunity for people to hear stories like this. You're never going to hear the stories like this. And that's where the seed was planted. And then through the work I do with um, bereaved families who've been bereaved by sudden death, I've also come into contact with some really extraordinary professionals who support them uh, through the worst days of their lives and again very hidden these are not the people you see on the paramedic shows they're the people mm. much further back behind the scenes and mm. i really wanted to give them a platform to be seen and to be heard in the way that they wanted to be heard so that's that's how it all started mm. tell us about that the work that you do with families um well i started working uh, in Parliament a very long time ago uh, with around HIV and AIDS when it came up, became a much bigger issue in the sort of late 80s, early 90s and mid 90s. And then I started working, I decided to leave that work. Um, I wanted to continue to, to work in Parliament, but I wanted to work with families whose cases either set a precedent or defended a principle that was in the wider public interest. And so, at which I did pro bono. And one of the cases I worked on was actually Britain's worst military peacetime disaster. It was the crash of a, a Chinook helicopter on the Mull of Kintyre in 1994, where two pilots were blamed, the SAS pilots were blamed for the crash, even though they were killed in the crash. And that led me into campaigning with families who were challenging miscarriages of justice. And uh, after mm. 17 years, um, wow. I that took us 17 years to clear the pilots' names. But then I've also been working alongside another organization called Murdered Abroad, um, which helps families whose relatives have been murdered abroad. Um, so that's also been another aspect of it. And I also work alongside people involved with uh, late-term stillbirth, which sounds a bit of a mar marginal and niche area. But again, it's connected to coroner's investigations. So, wow. Yeah. So a broad, a broad spectrum of people who've been bereaved by, by sudden death. Murdered abroad. So why is that an area of need or concern? I would imagine the police or the officials step in and it's job done. Oh, gosh, we should be so lucky. Um, no, very much not the case. Um, uh, in the UK, there's probably pre-COVID times, probably about 80 British nationals are murdered abroad. And there is a now, because we've lobbied for it, there is a unit inside the Foreign Office called the Murder and Manslaughter Team, um, which actually helped families through this process. But it is extremely traumatic. And I'm sure any of your mm. colleagues who work with families who are trying to trace or repatriate relatives, mm. family members, fat friends um, from foreign locations know very well how often their own countries are not very well placed to assist families in those circumstances. So we lobby with and work with the Foreign Office to try and improve the services that those families receive. And that can start from right from the word go, from repatriation through to telling them very simply, for instance, in the UK, if you don't repatriate the body into the UK, you won't get a coroner's investigation. And often that is sometimes the only investigation or real investigation that those families can participate in because it's very expensive to attend trials overseas and they can often take a very long time to take place. Mm. Wow. <laughs> it's cheery wow. work. <laughs> 
<laughs> wow, but you, you're doing incredible things to help families. It's it's terrible enough losing the life of someone that you love so mm. dearly, but mm. then not having mm. them physically in the country or not being able to communicate clearly with those oh. who actually have have your loved one's body. Absolutely. And in terms of dealing with foreign, um, you know, judicial systems, translation mm. systems, very different methods of, of, of dealing with the press. And I know, you know, like New Zealand and in England, we have very strong uh, rules around press engagement, around, um, you know, murders and, and things like that. Whereas in places like Thailand or in other mm. countries, there is none of that. So it's also protecting families. But when you're, you know, if somebody's unfortunate to be murdered in the UK, they have a very, very different experience than somebody whose relative has been murdered abroad. And it's the complexities are just absolutely, you know, just tenfold compared to what they would deal with if they were here. And and they don't get as much support. So yeah, there's a real inequality right. there. Which I'm a bit passionate to... about, aren't I? <laughs> <laughs> get a bit evangelical. <laughs> Yeah. Now the the episode that I that sticks in my mind from Dead Honest from your mm. podcast is where you were talking to a diver, mm. someone who was retrieving mm. or find trying to find and identify is there a body in mm. the water and mm. really mm. stuck in my mind some of the things that mm. the diver said and the way that you engage with the diver to bring out the story and mm. the things that she she was thinking about and the process yeah. that she goes through. So why don't you share with us? A couple of your stories and, and things that have stuck yeah. in your mind. Well, one of the principles behind Dead Honest, and, and it's one of the reasons why I think I get the level of engagement of the guests that I do, is because they have total editorial control over the episode. So they feel a level of trust, um, which mm. means they can be more candid. And often in the professions that they're in, they're misrepresented and, and very wary of, of talking to people like me. Right. So that is really fundamental to why these people open up in the way that they do and there's nothing that they have said that they haven't been absolutely okay with the episode with Suzanne Crossley who runs the dive team up in Northamptonshire up in in the north in England um was very moving on several fronts I mean what I found surprising was the things that stuck out for me was I didn't realize how much they're dealing in black water a lot of the time and they are dealing with very limited visibility i mean i suppose mm. we think as recreational divers it's very high levels of visibility for them obviously it's not they're using their hands they're creeping along the the the, the, the beds and it's extremely dangerous shopping trolleys tractors mm. you name it because there are a lot of urban urban environments around them and i think the thing that really hit me was when I said, what happens when you find the body? And she said, well, we can't bring it straight to the surface because the family may be there. And so sometimes my divers are below the surface cuddling a dead body for five or six minutes before we can mm. instruct them to take it further down the river and take it to a safe point where they can, um, the, the body can be taken out away from where the family might be. And and that those sort of things just mm. haven't struck me as being important. But she was a really interesting person and, and she highlighted something which has come up in several interviews, which is the importance of the team and how critical that is to supporting people's mental health. And right. one of the concerns that I can feel with people I interview now is where there have been massive cuts in budgets and people are now being sent out in smaller numbers, that that has a really profound impact on mm. the support system that those sort of organic support systems that those teams create around mm -hmm. themselves. So she was a she was a really interesting person. And again, often you hear with these, um, you know, as you heard in, in, in her interview, how delighted she was when she finds a body, because for her, the biggest and most important thing is reuniting that person with the family she's that they've, they've left behind. So what might be to us a really ugh, moment is for her a really great moment for her and her team and I think they're the sort of things which you can't really explain to the general mm. public if you're doing that sort of work only those people in your team know about it but I'm really passionate about making sure that people like me people from the public we do know about it so we respect and mm. value and acknowledge 
the extraordinary work that these people do. Another one of my interviewees is a fabulous guy called, called Mo Oliver, who works with Kenyan International, who I'm sure is known to probably quite a number of your students. They're a big disaster management organization. And Mo was involved in retrieving um, uh, and repatriating bodies of British nationals in the Boxing Day tsunami. And he was also right. involved in recovering war dead from Bosnia after the Bosnian war. And he talks about the experience of um, recovering, you know, a body that's been buried for a year and, mm. and thinking he couldn't quite work out why they had were wearing neckties. What were, why were they wearing neckties? And he realized, obviously, they weren't. They were blindfolds that had slipped down as the facial, uh, you know, had decomposed and they ended up. And, and it was just those sort of moments which I find sort of compelling to, to sort mm. of how do you do that job? How do you take the bodies off a skeleton that you know and you can recognize has once been a man and wash those clothes? And then how do you do that stuff and i think they're the questions which people like you know people in the whoop, people in the in the um part, you know the general public who may not be um not they're not morbid but they're curious and i think mm. what i hope to do is meet that curiosity that's that's what i try and do so mm. that there are two of those ones and and again sometimes it's the unexpected um it's the unexpected thing when i asked a police family liaison officer, a wonderful woman called Lou Pai, uh, you know, I said, um, you know, what is the toughest part of your role? And you know, she, she's going to murder victims, uh, you know, the family of murder victims and, and having to sit with them and be with them at that time. And I thought, well, that's going to be the hardest part of her role. And she said, it's not, it's my colleagues not really understanding what I do. And I thought, wow, that's really interesting. Mm. I didn't, I wouldn't have pinned that as being the bit that really affects you most in the work that you do and I think again that goes back to that thing around resourcing when people are, are being having to do jobs on top of their other jobs and family liaison officers here in the UK volunteer for that role over and above the work they already do as police officers right. so um you know she explains you know you can be going to oh sorry hang on a sec let me just get rid of that um I decline that. Sorry, sorry, Craig. That's okay. Um, it's I'm live. Sure where you've Anything gone. can happen. <laughs> it is. <laughs> this is, I think, the problem of wearing these headphones. Is I might be connected to my son's phone, so this could get a little interesting. Um, anyway, <laughs> um, but it was, yeah. I mean, for for somebody like Lou Pie, she was saying, you know, I'll I'll, I'll do my full day's work, and I'll I'll have to go and see a family. It'll only take ten minutes right. because I'm dropping off a document or something. And she said that will be the day that I walk into that home and it's the day that that mother has decided she's ready to show me the bedroom of her murdered child mm. and take out the family photos and show me a lock of his hair. And when I get back to the station and somebody says, what took you so long? She said, you know, I, I, I don't know how to, how can I explain that I couldn't just go in and out, you know? Yes. So I think for your, for your, um, you know, fellow professionals who are dealing with families face to face you would understand and appreciate the complexity of that which is often completely misunderstood mm. by our colleagues uh, around us so yeah i think that's the powerfulness of what you're doing is the understanding um of the public a greater yeah. understanding of the professionals and also hopefully bridging that gap for between the professionals themselves understanding the different roles that people carry like an emergency response often if someone's working on an oil rig they're an engineer or they're a they're a diver mm. or they're a cook or they're something but they volunteered mm. to do the mm. emergency certifications and to be in charge of safety yeah. if something happens so there's a an event and suddenly they're in charge and yeah. the, the roles have to switch and they could have been mm. you know someone who is away from the public and not in the front line and then suddenly mm. they're in charge of everybody yeah. being the on-site yeah. commander to deal with that situation and it's difficult for people to go and do a job people don't understand why you did how you did what you did yeah um, and then translate that back into real life i do want to wind back a little bit you said about mm. um the team the support the budget mm. cuts maybe the stress 
how mm-hmm. do these people who are dealing with the dead and the dying debrief and yeah. deal with that stress and maintain themselves? Yeah, well, it's really interesting that uh, dogs, dogs are big, <laughs> dogs feature in a big way. A lot of people I said that to, what do you do when you come back at the end of a day like this? And and it was, I, I talk to my dogs, I take my dogs for a walk. And wow. often they'll have partners who will say, how was your day? And we'll sort of walk off before they've heard the answer as a sort of self-protective mechanism possibly. Um, so dogs is a big one. I have to be honest with you. I hear that often. Um, but I think it's also, um, you, you know, that there is an acknowledgement. I mean, again, this is where the team is so important, is that because there are so few people you can talk to about this work, mm. that you need opportunities to be able to debrief with those people that you are with. And funny enough, you were talking about the engineer on the oil rig and, and this sort of incidental contact that sometimes people have in their roles, which has got nothing to do with, with dead and dying per se. And, and in one of the episodes, I have a... Um, an interview with this chap who we have a very well-known um, location in the UK where people take their lives and he is responsible. He has a contract to go and pick up the vehicles of the people who've taken their lives mm. and reunite them with the families um, that they've left behind. And he's a tow truck driver, you know, and yet he's having to do, sorry about this, he's having to do that work um, and and come into contact with death in that way. Um, uh, God, you never think I was an audio producer, would you, with this sort of earphones <laughs> dropping out of my head? <laughs> I'm such a pro, um, you know. Uh, but he, you know, he has to deal with that, and he has to deal with the grieving families. And he's a tow yeah. truck driver, so how does he do that? And mm. it's one of those things where I just think. Um, we when when we pass somebody like a tow truck driver on the road. Think of that person. They may have just been to a fatal accident and had to mm. sit in and pull the teddy bear out of the back seat of somebody's mm. car. And one of the things mm. I was really delighted about with that particular episode is that actually a major insurance company here in the UK heard it and are using it to train their staff to give them some understanding of the pressures that these tow truck drivers are facing, recovery truck drivers mm. are facing. So. Um, I think that's an important thing when people who are doing those roles that are slightly incidental, what are we doing to support them? And, and yeah, it's important. Yeah. I saw in your profile, Georgie, that you've always had an interest in justice and working yeah. in parliament. So tell us about that. Mm. Oh gosh. Yeah. I've always been a bit of a, um, uh, yeah, gosh. If I, yeah. I'm, I've, I've always, <laughs> I've always been a gritty bugger. Um, I don't know. It's funny. It's one of those things. I have a real um, issue with, uh, and I've never found a really elegant way of describing it, but other than big people shitting on little people. Mm. And so I don't know where that really came from. Um, uh, I, I genuinely don't know where that came from. I think I, I just have, have had that sense. And I was brought up with parents, particularly my mother, who was had a very strong social conscience. And so yeah, looking out for other people when they haven't had the same advantages or standing up and speaking when others can't. Um, mm. Yeah, I'm, and I think the death thing I, I came also. I grew up in the, in a, on a farm in Australia and we were very much surrounded by animals and things dying and it was a very normal and natural part of my sort of growing up. It wasn't, it was sort of stripped of its sentimentality when you're in that sort of environment. So that's also how I ended up doing the getting involved in issues around death and dying. Um, mm. Yeah, as I'm sure many people that, that, that you're working with and, and who are interested in this type of work are drawn to, they want to help people. And that's a, another unifying thing about the people I interview. They genuinely want to help people. This is more of a mm. vocation than a career. Mm. Um, yeah. And I think there's a lot of, a lot of humility that that I just find extraordinary, given the sacrifices that they they make. Yeah, that's lovely. So just just to wrap up, Georgie, for those who might aspire to, and it seems a strange aspiration, but for those who might aspire to or imagine that in their role they're going to deal yeah. with the dead and the dying, and particularly the families and colleagues who mm. are dealing with this as well, what's some advice mm. you might give them to prepare themselves or to work through it? 
Hmm. I mean, I, I genuinely think there are so many people out there with lived experience who are happy to give you their inside knowledge on how it was for them. For instance, one of the things that, you know, when we deal with the Foreign Office, we say, do not call a family at five o'clock on a Friday afternoon with bad news because they cannot get right. back to you for two days. So it's just these sort of be mindful that it might be an anniversary. Check the anniversary date of the person's death before you call them. There are some really basic things that you can do. And I think often... People are scared to go back to those people who've been affected and say, how could we have done this better? But actually, they are really keen to make sure the next family is dealt with better than they were. So right. my thing would be go and talk to the families that you know have been through something. If it's a recent disaster or a disaster five or 10 years ago, you know, just say they often they have support groups. Can you come and have a chat to us? Tell us what you we should have known about before we had that engagement with you or what would you offer back to us and tell us because they are the experts. I'm a bit passionate right. about this. I know everybody thinks experts are people who've been to university. I, I think they're professionals, but expertise for me often comes from the people who have that lived experience and therefore use it because mm. they want you to be better at what you do as much as you do. Mm. That's yeah. great. Yeah, that's really like cool. a bit of a tagline, didn't it? They want you to be as good as what you do as they, whatever I said. <laughs> <laughs> we have to rewind it and watch it. That yeah, was exactly. Good. It was quite good, wasn't it? Mm. I, I like that it's the simple things, actually, Georgie, you're thinking yeah. about what was the birth date. If I'm going to ring someone and tell them their son or their daughter has died, and it's mm. actually their birthday, that's mm. not that's not news that you want to carry because it's a significant moment in the mm. year. And to tag it to Christmas or a birthday mm. or Easter, something that rolls around every year, it just makes it that doubly hard, you know? It, it does. And, and I think the other thing is because this is such a brutal experience for people, the very smallest acts of kindness are remembered. Mm, um, I like that. And, and, and I think the other thing is that we often say is that, you know, one, people, particularly people in officialdom, they don't want to get in contact with if they've got nothing to say. And that is an absence of contact that actually is deafening for families. So even when you don't have anything mm. to say, call the family and say, we've got nothing to say but I wanted to let you know that we're thinking of you or that we just wanted to keep you in touch. That is so important, that continuity wow. of contact. Um, yeah. Even when you've got nothing to say, it doesn't make any difference. And it also means that you will then continue to engender their goodwill. It's so easy to lose their goodwill because so much that's bad has happened to them. So you've got a lot of ground to cover for other people who've obviously also let them down. But yep. as I said, the smallest things can make the biggest difference. It does. It's not that hard to make a big difference. Yeah, the absence of contact is deafening. It's deafening, yeah. yep. deafening. And and it's it's often where we've seen families really disengage in the process and be highly critical of officialdom is when one phone call was missed. Or the other thing that we have an absolute bugbear about, answer machine messages that are not returned. Or, right. you know, yeah, it's really simple stuff. It's It's not rocket science. Georgie, thank you for the work that you're doing. Thank you for the podcast okay. and and being a champion for justice and the work that you're doing with murder abroad with um, mm. you know, helping the families navigate that what would be naturally a normally difficult process but even more difficult with international bureaucracy so yeah. thank you for the work that you're doing and thank you Pleasure. very much for giving us your time this morning Pleasure, love it to have a chat Please don't go anywhere, I want to have a quick chat to you after we wrap up Sure but for those of you watching the recording, particularly if you're an emergency manager, you know that you're always training, you're always upskilling, and you've got this big binder full of training and certifications that you've done, and maybe it doesn't translate to an academic degree. That's why we were established. So uard.org or uard.ac.nz. Do contact us, and we'll give you credit for your recognition of prior learning and for your industry experience, so you can get that postgraduate degree or even your first degree much faster. And again, thank you to Georgie and for the rest of you we'll see you again soon on the next video cast